Well, welcome everybody to a very special episode of Level Up. It's our 50th show um, today. So a bit of a celebration, I think, amongst the team here and uh, brilliant to see you all joining now online. Fantastic. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining us for this milestone event. As usual, it's 60 minutes of live Q&A where your questions and votes drive the show. And when we thought up this format originally, you know, there's a lot of scepticism from people around, you know, would that actually work? But, you know, um, it does mean that everybody remains authentic and we're able to answer the questions that you raise and also the questions that our panellists raise on your behalf as well. So it's very much a community driven approach. To celebrate uh, this milestone, we've got some great giveaways for you, so stay tuned. And we'll let you know how you can join in with all of that. Um, do use the Slido link in the chat. We've got some colleagues on social media, both on LinkedIn and on YouTube, who are going to be encouraging you to introduce yourself, say hi, tell us where you're from in the world and so on, and um, add your questions that you would like to put to the panel. And also, if you go over to slido.com, you can vote up the questions that you think are most relevant and that you would most like answered. Now, Level Up is live, of course, Mondays at 8 and Fridays at 2 p.m. UK time. So next week, I'm just signposting for you that um, British summertime, daylight saving um, kind of kicks in. So uh, the clocks here locally in the UK will move forward one hour. And I think a lot of folks are still in that genre of following us uh, in that tradition, if you like. So I know colleagues in the US have already changed over to daylight saving and uh, in other countries, um, they will be changing back to the uh, regular time uh, in the Southern Hemisphere soon. Okay, you can find out a lot more about what we do at APMG International by visiting our website, apmg-international.com. Today, we're going to be talking about the future skills that service managers are going to need across their hybrid careers from big data to big ideas, from the leadership skills that they might need to pick up to uh, improving their commercial awareness and helping their organizations secure more meaningful business. So let's jump straight in. We'll meet our panel who are waiting for your questions. Joining us for the first time today is Jan van Bon. Uh, Jan joins us um, as the chair and the lead architect of the Service Foundation. His focus is on reducing complexity, and increasing value for organizations. He's an accomplished author in his own right and a contributor to hundreds of service management books. So welcome, Jan, great to have you on the panel. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's, um, I think, my task to think a little bit out of the box as we focus on methodical approaches to service management, uh, which are not usual approach. So let me see whether I can uh, fulfill that expectation for you. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we'd really be delighted uh, if you could do. Um, Stefan Brendel is returning to the panel um, today. Stefan, of course, works in APMG. He has deep domain experience in the world of service management and now focuses on building long-term business relationships, um, coaching APMG channel partners across Europe and South America. So welcome back, Stefan. Great to see you. Thanks, Nick, and um, <clears throat> glad to be back here on episode number 50. Um, as, as we can celebrate this today. And um, <clears throat> looking forward to this panel discussion. It's, it's a very, very hot topic, I think. And um, I also like to contribute uh, things I know from my role as a, as a board member of ITSM. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Gary Gamp makes his third appearance, I think, on Level Up today. Might have that wrong, Gary. Apologies if that's not quite right. He's a senior partner, of course, at Positive Momentum, a passionate believer in lifting up professional service colleagues to fulfill their full potential. He's the co-author of the Professional Services Professional Framework, and Gary also hosts a very successful mm -hmm. podcast called The Company Doctor. Welcome back, Gary. Great to see you again. Thank you, Nick. Great to be invited back. Obviously, it was okay last time. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about this particular day because uh, my superpower is service, and I'm looking forward to sharing some war stories together with everyone on service. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Mark Rovers is a perennial, I think it's fair to say, as spring <laughs> springs into action in the UK. Mark Rovers is definitely a perennial. And he's the president, of course, over at Interprom, where he educates and coaches leaders, professionals and teams, specialising in the portfolio of skills that all service managers need to embrace. And of course, by perennial, I mean, he's a regular <laughs> contributor here. Welcome back, Mark. Great to see you again. <clears throat> 
Thanks again, Nick, for having me, and congratulations to you and the team with episode number 50. What an accomplishment. Little did we know at episode one that this is going to be, and there was going to be a number 50. So fantastic. Thanks again. Look forward to this episode, and uh, great to be such a distinguished panel. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Dirk Solner is a solopreneur who engages and coaches his clients through his vision of strengthening people using proven empathetic technique. Um, uh, Dirk runs the German language podcast, uh, Auf die Ohren und ins Hirn. I've probably pronounced that really dreadfully badly, Dirk, so you can you can correct me in a moment. And he's published the reference book, IT Service Management with FitSM, uh, also in the German language. So please, Dirk, can you can you pronounce that properly for this uh, Englishman? Hello, Nick. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Happy to start my week with APMG and uh, happy to start my week with Level Up. So um, yeah, should be better to translate it. It means to your ears and right into your brain. So um, oh. it's a German um, podcast, but it means right through your ears into your brain. So um, I'm, I'm working as a, uh, um, you said it, I'm working as a, um, uh, as an independent self-employed trainer, and I'm helped to to contribute with some agile thoughts, with uh, Scrum, and um, with DevOps. With DevOps, and so I've got um, I'm engaged in uh, IT in IT service management since 2007, and later on I put on Scrum 2013 and DevOps in 2017. So nice to meet you all, guys here. Okay, thank you very much, Dirk. Um, really appreciate that. And uh, I love that idea. You know, we listen to things and it gets right into our mindset and starts to, you know, change the way in which we think about the world. So fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. We've got a very strong panel for that today. So if you're watching online, um, don't be shy. Introduce yourselves in the chat. Tell us whereabouts you're tuning in from and um, get your questions into the panel. Our question master for today is Sachitra, Sachitra Jacob. She is joining us from Bangalore in India. So uh, welcome back, Sajitra, and may we have our first question, please. Hi, everyone. The first question is from Henk. How important is service management in an organization with more and more services being outsourced to cloud providers or external providers? Okay, so the world of outsourcing and the importance of service management. Stefan, start us off and then we'll hear from Jan. Yeah, I think this is uh, this is an interesting observation that uh, service management. Um, if, if you look at the the technical operations in in incident, problem, and change, a lot of that is actually carried out by service providers who are not no longer part of the organization. Um, but I think um, in order to manage those service providers, in order to um, to define the contracts, the benefits, maybe even the commissions that are going to be paid, it is important that service managers or, or the, the idea of service management still lives in an organization to know how to control these people and can control these service providers. That's my 50 cent on it. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Jan and then Mart. Uh, it might be worthwhile to look at the question behind this question because I think it presumes that service management would be less important if you outsource, which in my perspective is complete nonsense because service management is the only thing you do. Organizations nowadays are 100% service providers or service management is for business, for the entire economy, the whole society. Why would outsourcing ever influence the importance of service management at all? Yeah, indeed, it's um, it's an interesting, you know, kind of angle, you know, to the question. So I agree with that, Dirk, um, uh, Jan. Rather, it's uh, it's kind of looking at it in a very different way. March, your thoughts, please. Service management uh, for those organisations that are pretty mature, have a well established service management practice, typically have an easier job of outsourcing since um, they, it's easier for them to align services. And when you say alignment of services, you say alignment of processes. And, um, for those that are a little bit mature in it, in um, just uh, sourcing and the way they would like to see their own um, strengths. Thank you very much. Yeah, keep it to themselves. Give it away to us. 
Yeah, indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Mart. Uh, Gary, your thoughts, please. Yeah, I don't want to disagree with my panellists, but I, I think it, it does make a difference because if uh, services are being outsourced or moving to the cloud, then the service managers are broker. I mean, most of their time is spent collaborating with other parts of the organisation. So therefore, they probably need to up their game because if, if some of the service aspect is going outside, it needs to be managed collaboratively. Really good point, um, because you know, to a certain extent, if if you're working inside one organisation, um, sometimes you give gifted authority, aren't you? You know, senior people are gifted authority through the line management of others or the management of teams, and so on and so on and so on. When you're working with third parties, it changes to the relationship to one more of working together and building bridges and building influence, where perhaps you don't have that authority. And um, Jan, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, you, you can outsource anything you want, or you can outsource your responsibility for delivering certain technology to or whatever, but you cannot outsource your accountability. So from the customer perspective, which is, I think, the only way to look at it in a mature society, the only thing you do is deliver the services. It doesn't matter for the customer how you deliver them. You are accountable for delivering the services that are agreed. Whether you outsource it, you do it yourself, or you, you pull it from the sky. For the customer, it's not interesting how you do it. You are accountable, and accountability simply cannot be outsourced. I think that's certainly true, certainly in our business, you know, where we work with a whole variety of different technology providers and service providers. Not everybody is directly employed by APMG, and so we're constantly spending time <sighs> you know, working with them, you know, to figure out how can we tune this particular service provision to make it the very best that it can be. And, you know, how do you recover from situations where some, sometimes despite everybody's best efforts, you know, it didn't go quite so well as you might have expected. So really interesting and a fantastic question. So thank you very much indeed, Hank, for raising that one with us. It's really got us uh, kind of thinking and uh, getting getting us going on episode 50. So thank you. <clears throat> Let's move on. Um, Suchita, if we can, please, we'll take the next question. Next question is from our panelist, Yan. What is the difference between a service manager, a business relationship manager, and a supply manager? Oh, okay, now I'm kind of thinking of those little wooden dolls that all fit inside each other. Yeah, and so I'm going to come to you later on, if I may, first of all. Um, panel, what are your thoughts about the nuance here and the differences between um, these different roles? Uh, I mean, I guess for modern professionals, they're, they're starting to embrace all of them. But um, Stefan, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm afraid this would be a very long answer um, if you really want to distinguish, but maybe there's one. I see the service manager more on, on the accepting order, and I, I know I'm polarizing now quite a bit, but it's, it's uh, tell me your requirements and I try to make them happen. While the business relationship manager actually doesn't distinguish between IT or IT service management, and the business relationship management is rather generating the demand in business relationship management is called demand shaping, where you um, actually tell the customer what is possible for him, things he hasn't thought of. Maybe that's that's a fair distinguishment. Um, say, where's the difference between those? Okay, thank you very much indeed. Gary, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think the world's moved on. I think the service manager used to be there to, as the lesser part of service, but actually what's been proven over time is they've probably got the three-legged stool. One is they've got to be really good at, obviously, customer service, and the operational aspects is the second one. But the third one is they need to understand the business. And I think there was a bit of a, a, a nod to it in your uh, description at the beginning, Nick, about the, the wooden dolls. I think They've got to be good at all of those things. So I'm not sure if we need to differentiate. I just think they need to amalgamate. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Jan, you raised the, the, the question. Um, what are your, what's yeah. your perspective on this? I did it for a reason, of course, because um, even this discussion illustrates that the terminology we use in service management is interpreted in many ways. If I would pull the definition of the service manager from 100 ISO standards, I probably would get a hundred different definitions. 
Mm-hmm. That means that if, if we don't get an idea about the concept of a service manager before we start b- talking about the skills of the service manager, we are probably not even understanding each other. So from my perspective, uh, I work in a very methodical way always. I look at the term service manager by decomposing it. It's the combination of manager and service. So if anyone manages the service, it's the service manager. That means that he's entirely uh, responsible for managing the service, which means the interaction with the customer, making sure everyone involved delivers what he needs to do, whether it's an inside operational team or an external supplier, or everything that is listed here should be within the profile of a service manager. And if you then want to decompose it, that's okay, but you must work from the whole, from the system, to get in control of the role of service manager. Very much some really great insight there. Um, Mart, what would you like to add? Just a quick addition indeed. The service manager I see managing a service, I think supplier managers and business managers manage a relationship. Okay, all right, thank you very much. I mean, I would say that it's most definitely a continuum. My my experience of this, having uh, had the kind of responsibility directly uh, in a job title, <laughs> very much kind of nailed down. And then at other times in my career, it, it's, it's more assumed um, that you're going to be able to understand all of that. So there's certainly a maturity dimension to it as well. You know, if you're early career and you're working in an organization, particularly a large one, your role may be fairly narrowly focused in order for you to be able to get the depth of experience that you need. And as you progress through your career, and it's a broader range of capability, it's a broader range of techniques and skills and, and knowledge that you need to acquire along the way. So thank you very much indeed, panel. Some really interesting insight into that. Now, if you're watching us online and you'd like to put a question directly uh, to the panel, then please do um, just type it into the chat and one of our colleagues will pick it up and we'll bring it across and, and uh, include it in the show. So Chitra, let's have our next question, please. Question from Marion. What qualifications would you suggest for someone who wants to be a service manager? All right, so qualifications and courses of study. Dirk, start us off on this one, please. Oh, um, I, I would like to suggest uh, starting with service management. I think, so I think that that's okay. But uh, I would also recommend um, having looks on a uh, look on uh, agile things on um, improvement and uh, continuous improvement. So have a look on the on the other frameworks on the other um, approaches we have. So um, just do not look only on on service management. Um, get more um, get a, get a, get a more look on on agile things on on DevOps and all the things. So. ITIL is good. Service management is really useful and, and, and important, but it should be, uh, a, 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 you should have a, a little more a widened uh, look on that. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Jan, your thoughts, please. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right in terms of uh, that a service manager needs a widened look at everything he does because he's the manager. He's accountable for the services being up and being delivered as agreed which means that he should understand all the technology that's used and, and all the teams that contribute to that, whether they are internal or external, and suppliers or internal operations teams, it doesn't matter. But first of all, the service manager should understand the whole system of service delivery because he's in charge of the service, which means that he should understand the system. And that is something that is lacking in, in all education programs on public education, but also in most of the education uh, and the training uh, offerings in the in the market. What I would suggest is that someone first studies the systematic way of how to manage a service at all, and then focus on the technology and the, the organizational structure and everything in terms of relationship management that comes next to it. But it must be based on an understanding of how any organization would deliver any system, any service at all. Thank you very much indeed, Stefan, and then Gary. I think the the, the fundamental um, thing that every service man needs to know is like what Jan said. It's it's, it's all the um, the principles, incident, problem, all that. You have to understand how a service organization works even before you start talking to customers about how to improve a service. So you have to have your building block. 
uh, where you stand on. Um, I'm, I'm personally not no longer convinced that idle will provide that because idle used to provide that. It does no longer. It is more a holistic, um, um, one size fits all approach, as we can see. But if it, if it comes down to those um, elements that are really needed, um, and the basic principles, then there is lots around. Um, um, probably FitSM is more the public source, but Idle is more commercialized. Um, the service foundation uh, that Jan's talking about is is probably the best one from if you look at um, at a holistic view on service management and as such, not just IT, but as such, yeah. It comes down to IT service management. You need to have these principles that are provided by FitSM because that's 80% of that you can you can actually use immediately. Or with idle, it's about 20% from 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 what you learn you can use. So it's it's the typical Pareto. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um Gary, what 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 angle would you give us on this? Yeah, I mean obviously I agree with my colleagues on the fundamentals but actually you know we need to be more customer centric i think and it, to be customer centric the customers have a, a requirement they've got an outcome that they're looking for so we're providing service to match that outcome so we need to understand where they're coming from what they actually want first of all and then secondly we need to focus on the customer experience so what are the things we're doing to improve the customer experience and finally a lot of making things happen in an imperfect world is is relationships because although there's process and ways of getting things done, a lot of it is based on you know relationships and cajoling people to get things to happen. Um, but a bit biased, the PS professional certification has a massive take up in the service management community because it complements the skills in ITIL and, and some of the other qualifications because it focuses on you know, on customer uh, the customer experience and the personal effectiveness of getting stuff done. So I think I'd add that to the, the list that's already described. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I totally agree with that. I think that, you know, in the first instance, um, when you're thinking about your career in service management, it's a good idea to, you know, to reflect on a role perhaps which is two or three steps away from where you are now and reverse engineer from that and think about the sorts of um, experiences and qualifications and certifications that you're going to need along that journey. All right, if you're going to cross a a, a, a broad river <laughs> and there are some stepping stones, you need to understand what your destination is before you embark on the first stepping stone. Okay, so so that that's where I would suggest you kind of begin. All right, have a little think about what kind of future you're looking for, and then work backwards from that. A firm foundation in being able to understand what you know service management is all about is, of course, you know super helpful. You know, but to everybody's point here, there's something much more than that. You know, if you join in with a cohort of people who have all got, uh, I don't know, for argument's sake, you know, ITIL, you, you are not differentiating yourself by definition. Okay, you're just joining in with lots and lots of other folks. And so you need to be able to differentiate yourself somehow and qualifications allow you, of course, to capture your aptitude for doing something. Maybe you've not got the experience of doing it yet, but you're demonstrating that you have the aptitude to do it. And you crystallize that through gaining a certification um, that allows you to have that passport to a future role where you can indeed become responsible for it and equally so over time accountable you know, for leading on that particular um, area of work. So plenty to explore there from PS professional to the unified world of uh, service management to, you know, the light and lean fit SM as well, all blending together to make a service manager role for the future. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, panel. So Chitra, let's take our next question, please. We have a question from a live viewer, Adam Medri. Any difference between a service manager and a delivery manager? I think the project manager, product manager, or delivery manager are service managers. Mm. Well, this was one of the comments that I think the panel made earlier on. If you kind of open up yeah. free service management management you know, kind of books, you'll find five definitions. Uh, Jan, what are your thoughts on this? 
Now, I think uh, the uh, this question, uh, Aska, is indeed right. All of these roles are service manager, but from a smaller perspective, because if you are running a small operations team, the thing you do is to contribute to the whole of the service that the organization delivers. So whatever your position is, it is a position from your team delivering services to the others. That means that you are a service manager. Actually, you are a service organization. So what applies to you applies to a set of teams, applies to the whole organization, applies to the enterprise, and then we are ending up with enterprise service management. So the whole idea about service management is that you deliver some value to another. So all of these definitely can be observed as being service managers, but uh, this obviously is a, a matter of perspective. Are we talking about the enterprise service or about the team service? Thank you very much indeed, Jan. Uh, Dear. Um, I would like to to contribute contribute with a point that I think uh, the the modern organizations are going more to more to product orientated organizations. So I think um, a service manager could be more than a product owner or a product manager. So I think a service manager should uh, should be viewed as a as a as responsible and accountable for service. And I think service is close related to product orientation. So moving back from from uh, from project management and to product oriented organizations and i think a product manager or a service manager are those guys who have uh, who should be a, a, accountable for that excuse me thank you very much indeed gary yeah i think they are different i think they're part of a tag team if you think of a project it has a start and an end and service management is a continuum i used to work in outsourcing and it, it would be called the life cycle team. So I think they're a tag team, but service management almost as a crossover from project to service, and then the hand the, hand the baton over to the service manager to run. Obviously, they can give input to products. Uh, that would be my thoughts. All right. Thank you. Good. Good point. Um, Jan, uh, I'd like to emphasise that the the products of a service organisation is the service. And a project may be a technical way of delivering a change to a service, but it's also part of service. So whatever we're talking about in terms of products uh, focusing organizations or whatever, they are service focusing organizations. So the product of a service organization is the service. Are we actually saying the same thing. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And kind of a thing. You know, your question is is kind of bridging these worlds of you know agile development and service delivery and and how all of these roles play out. Now, each method tends to use very similar language to be able to describe the principal role and responsibility of individuals within a team situation. And so, one may place greater emphasis on strengthening one particular word, and uh, another may place a slightly different emphasis on that same phrase. So, um, read broadly is what I would suggest for your particular set of circumstances and start thinking about how best do you move the whole team and the whole organization forward and use the nomenclature that uh, you know that really suits that more holistic approach very good thank you panel and a great question so thank you kadem for uh, for raising it let's move on to chitra we'll take our next question question from henry thomas how does a service manager earn a seat at the strategy table Okay, excellent question. Jan, start us off. You've worked with uh, C-suite people for many years. How do you actually manage to influence that uh, strategy, if you like? Uh, I, I think it would be best, again, to look at the question behind the question, because why would you uh, ever earn a position at a strategy table? That means you have a, a high business-related relationship with the people you work for. And if, this is obviously uh, a matter of perspective in terms of maturity, because just imagine that you are a provider of technology. Why would you, as a provider of some technological, technological means, ever be on the boards of your customer? That would be completely ridiculous. If you would provide uh, systems, which are combinations of technology, why would you ever earn a position at the strategy table? If you are a cloud provider, why would a cloud service provider be in the board of a customer? That is, I think, a ridiculous idea. The only way to earn a seat at the strategy table 
is when you are contributing to the business value of your customer, which means that you should at least act at level four of the value maturity model. And all the other examples that I mentioned, even service providers, cloud service providers, are only level three or lower. So how do you earn a seat at the table? By demonstrating that you are able to deliver value in a customer-centric way of service delivery, not by delivering cloud services, technology, or whatever. <coughs> Very much indeed. Some controversial thoughts there a little bit, certainly stimulating my mind um, a wee bit, yeah. Uh, Dirk, and then we'll hear from Mart. Oh, um, Jan, I would like to say great speech. I, I would totally agree to that. And um, I, I can't find uh, no more words for that. It's okay. To, totally my point of view. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Sometimes that does actually happen when we kind of, you know, because all of this is just happening live. Okay. We we kind of jump yes. straight in and we kind of share our thoughts. So brilliant. Thank you very much, Jake. Um, Mark, uh, what would you like to add? Yeah, Dirk said it. Um, so I'm with Dirk and Jan on this one, indeed. It's, um, I think, once, once you're able as a service manager to, um, indeed deliver the value that your customers are looking for. And um, a nice phrase these days is being used is to shape the demand for your service. I think then um, you've proven you know, to be of value and that's where you want to be because that earns trust and that also that earns a seat at the table. Okay, excellent, thank you very much indeed. The one thought that I would have for everybody is that you know, um, lots of folks want to move up to, you know, work on strategy within their own organization. And uh, really what they're desperate for here is to be listened to. And one thing that I've learned over these 50 episodes of Level Up is that um, we all need to improve our listening skills and really think about, you know, the words that are being shared with us by you know, our colleagues on these panels and take them into our heart. You know, we began the episode talking about, you know, Dirk's podcast and thinking about, you know, how listening can actually change the way in which you think about things and just really embed that thinking in your own mind. Um, Jan, go ahead. You're absolutely right in terms of the capability of listening. But to be able to listen to your customer, you require a similar language. And I think that is a, a big obstacle in, in history of service management, because um, if you are up, let's say, to level three of maturity, when you're focusing on systems, technology, or cloud services, stuff like that, and you speak a technological language, the customer speaks a business language, which is a very different language. If you're not understanding what the contribution of your services to that business is, and you will not be able to hear what the customer says, and he won't understand what you say. So listening, uh, it's a good initiative, but it won't help. So straighten out your language. Okay, thank you very much, indeed. It's a really important point. Uh, Stefan and then Gary. Yeah, <clears throat> just uh, I don't want to challenge anything, but just to just recall that we had a, had a question in the, in the very beginning from Hank about distinguishment of service manager and business relationship manager. Now the BRM is the one that actually can earn a seat at the strategy table, but he's coming from a different angle. He's exactly what Jan says, he's talking to business language. He doesn't distinguish between IT and business. The principle there is business is IT. So, so he's sitting there, he or she is sitting there. And I think that makes a big difference. And that's why a service manager in the end it's just a jump too short. Um, to, thank to you the very value. much indeed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Gary, final thoughts? Well, yeah, yeah. just to give some advice to the person that asked the question, I, I think the service manager, there's a blurring of the edges between business and service, as we've spoken about. And I think the service manager can earn the right by helping grow the business and therefore earn their right at the table. And that's what I see happening in bigger accounts, where the service manager is, is almost in the bit, in the middle of upselling because of the quality of service they provide and therefore they'd be invited to more likely to be invited to the table all right thank you very much indeed and um you know that's the way in which you know you kind of climb the tree to get the better view to see over the horizon and uh, start to influence you know your organization strategy and so on keep on adding value the more value that you add and the more common sense that you speak 
generally, the more people will listen to you because it all makes complete sense. All right, very good. Now, look, if you're thinking about you want to join in with, in with us uh, with some of our giveaways, we do have some more information on that coming up in a little while that we're going to fill you in on. It's very straightforward, very easy. And we're going to be giving away things like some free examination vouchers so that you can take some of the credentials that the panel has been talking about so far. All right. So uh, some great prizes for you to be able to join in with. Just um, stay with us and we'll get to those in a little while. So Chitra, let's move on. We'll take our next question, please. The next question is from Matthew in Singapore. What is the role of a service manager in the DevOps world? All right, Dirk, start us off, please. So um, I'm working on, on DevOps projects as a consultant, as an HR coach, and, and I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, what is DevOps, even for my podcast. So I think DevOps should be more than doing HR. Um, I think that service manager is more relevant to the um, to that point than product owners. Or in other words, I would like to say a good product owner coming from agile thinking, from agile uh, methods, should learn, could learn from a service manager. So I think a service manager has uh, a more holistic, uh, uh, a more overview on that. Thank you very much indeed. And Jan? Uh, that, <clears throat> that indeed is in line with the ideas of a service manager being responsible. And if you look at DevOps, there's two big benefits that we, we derive from DevOps. The first one is that it improves the direct communication with the customer. The second one is that it accelerates the speed of change. Now, the combination of the two are the benefits of DevOps. Uh, the, the backside, the shadow side of DevOps, of course, is that we cut the silos that we had into many, 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 many small uh, shops. And all these shops can do whatever they want. They're trying to do the thing they, they, they think should be done best. And they all do different things. So there are a little uh, a number of frogs in a, in a box and they jump everywhere. Uh, how do you get in control from one silo compared to 25 frogs in a box and uh, jumping everywhere? So we need to standardize whatever we do with DevOps in terms of this value created with DevOps. And I think the service manager is the one responsible for that. So if you choose to follow up on DevOps guidelines, and uh, improve your communication and accelerate your speed of change. And that still is under the wings of the service manager because he's responsible, he's accountable for the service. So DevOps is interesting. It has potential improvement. It has a, a backside as well. And the service manager always should be the one delivering the results to the customer and being in charge. Yeah, there's certainly that golden thread there, isn't there, of reducing the barriers between different groups, improving the communication. And of course, communication is a flow and it's a conversation and it works uh, kind of both ways. So very good. Thank you, panel. Uh, Suchitra, um, we're going to move on. If you're watching online and you'd like to ask a question, and I can see many of you are watching online now, so welcome uh, to Level Up. Um, but please do put your question in the chat and then we'll put it in front of the panel straight okay. away. Suchitra, next question, please. Question from Jeff, could you recommend any service management communities I can join to build my knowledge and network? Okay, so which communities would we recommend? Stefan, start us off, please. Not a, not a big surprise, but um, the, the largest community still is the IT Service Management Forum. And they started when IDLE actually uh, became famous. And as far as I know, um, at least Jan and I have some some history in the IT service management form. They have changed scope, they're going wider. It's no longer a, a promoting just a qualification. Um, it is, it, it's a good starting point because this, this is where people are sitting from different angles and in particular from end user organization, because that's what you need. You need to understand, not, not necessarily understand how an agile or a, 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 an, an idle expert is thinking about, it, about how are these things supplied? How are they brought to a better service? Um, and this is where you can learn in those communities. Okay, thank and you they're all, much all over Gary. the world. Yeah, it's a really good point. There's, there are usually communities in each country uh, from the ITSMF. Gary and then Dirk. Yeah, a bit of a left field one from me, but 
you know, sometimes it's worth taking the initiative yourself. So if you're a service manager, get together with some like-minded people from different uh, industries, maybe from different organizations and, and get together in a more informal way. Because I think you can learn quite a lot from other people doing a similar role, but it's initiated by you. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, it certainly does work incredibly well, that. Uh, Dirk and then Jan. So in, in addition to, to Stefan, I think knowledge of ITIL is very helpful. But uh, to my point of view, FitSM is, is, a, is a really useful and it's, it's a clearly framework. And um, it's, um, I think the two parts I would um, focus on, uh, two advantages. Um, first, the requirement view. Um, FitSM is, uh, is written as uh, some requirements you have to meet and you have to work on. So this is the first part I would like to, to focus on. And the other part is that I think FitSM is really based and developed around the PDCA circle, the, the, the Deming circle. So from my point of view, modern times, you have to deliver quality. You have to improve your, the, your organization by building up a quality management system. And I think uh, the PDCA circle will help for that. And FitSM is built around that circle. So two good points for uh, two, not three, two, two points for FitSM. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Jan? Uh, if we go back to the community thing, then um, I, I'm totally in line with Stefan. I think the ITSMF is still the leading force in the field of service management. And, and I'm very happy to see that they are widening up because they, in, in, in history they have been focusing on ITIL. And I, I've been there. Uh, mea culpa, I'm guilty. Eh? I joined that. Uh, but if you look at the Netherlands, ITSMF has died years ago. And its role is being picked up by another organization. It, it doesn't really matter. So there always are national organizations uh, on an individual scale that contribute to the knowledge of service management. But those are organizations. There's another way of looking at the word community, and that is through loosely coupled uh, sets of people. For instance, LinkedIn groups. I run a couple of LinkedIn groups, not just a couple, a lot, I think. And I've got more than uh, 250,000 people in my groups. And we manage the groups from the perspective of knowledge sharing. All, all commercial activities are banned from that. You're blacklisted as soon as you post a job. But you are exchanging knowledge and experience. And those groups can be very valuable from the perspective of a community. Because I think the community's uh, aim is to exchange knowledge and improve the way we're doing uh, our jobs. I would like to yeah, emphasize would, the alternative of LinkedIn groups. Yeah, I would completely agree with that. The way that communities form now and develop is has changed considerably. When I started my career back in about 100 years ago or so, you had to physically find <laughs> some other people. And you kind of went, you know, to uh, uh, often it was usually an employer, you know, it was a meeting room. Somebody lent their meeting room. OK, and I, I worked for a fairly large uh, software company um, at the time. So we were often hosting groups um, from different you know, genres and different users and different perspectives on on uh, on thinking about using technology for you know, for business good and so on. And it was an incredibly um, active uh, period, and it was very, very useful to spend time with, with other folks. Um, a lot of that stuff does take place online now, and you can start to join those community groups by looking on LinkedIn. All of the panelists um, uh, are on the APMG International website, and there's a little button there so that you can connect with those panelists on LinkedIn. And you can join in and hear from them directly as to the kinds of groups that they're involved with. Everybody on here is a coach or a mentor or a trainer or a supporter of others. OK, so we're all here to help you in your career. Please do reach out to us and we'll point you in some good directions. And um, as Gary said, if you can't see, you know, um, something which is there, which makes sense, start your own. Start your own. OK, who knows? In a couple of years time you might be sitting like Jan is with a community of a quarter of a million people kind of around you all exchanging ideas and sharing things the one thing that I would please ask is if you if you connect with us on LinkedIn please don't try and sell us something <laughs> Okay, because we're not really here for that. We're here to help you. Okay, and uh, we might we might ask you for help as well because uh, we don't know everything. All right, so uh, join in with all of that. Very good. Thanks, panel. Let's move on to Chitra. We'll take our next question, please. Question from Gary, our panelist. Hearing lots about customer success, 
What's the difference between service management and customer success? All right, it's a really insightful question. This, Jan, you start us off, please. Uh, the, the logic itself says, of course, that service management has only one goal, and that is to make a customer more successful, because that's the definition of value. Adding value means that the customer can cope with more situations than without that service. So, service management is about enabling a customer to do better. A customer success is actually the goal of service management, so that they are complementary to each other. There's no difference. They are complementary. They're totally uh, different in nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Gary, when you posed the question, what was your thinking? Yeah, so in, in the software business, customer success as a function is developing, and it's, a, it's an equivalent to service management. Um, and, and, and it's an infinite loop. So you talked before about, you know, it's the continuum. And what, what they're finding, so if you look in the software industry, the, the customer success manager is reducing churn, improving the customer experience and increasing revenue in a, in a loop. So you know, it, I, I think it's one to look out for in the future for service managers. Um, you know, see what's going on in customer success. It's becoming an industry on its own. And I think at one point, I'm seeing a lot of companies, my customer base, are trying to become customer success in, instead of service management. Or as well as. Indeed. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point, isn't it? You know, we've had kind of emerging roles around user experience, you know, customer um, management, customer relationship management, so on, and now customer success. So it's a natural evolution, I think, you know, for those words to be starting to be used to describe, you know, a, a capability in an organization as well as, um, you know, an outcome, if you like. So that makes complete sense to me. Thank you very much. Um, indeed. Um, so, Chisha, I think we've got time for one more question before we um, get into the uh, registration for things like giveaways and that kind of thing. We have a question from Omar in Sydney. Is artificial intelligence impacting service management? And if so, how? Right. AI, well, most, most certainly a lot of the service management principles have been put into uh, software now, and um, there's a whole range of algorithms which are being used to augment, if you like, that customer experience and bring you a little closer to solving your own problem in as, in as few steps as possible. So that's certainly around. Um, Jan, start us off, then we'll hear from Dirk. Uh, artificial intelligence, of course, uh, will impact service management because it enables the insight of the service manager into what is the result of the service delivered to the customer. So, like any other technological improvement that we uh, any technological development that we run into, it can help to improve service management. But service management, at the end of the day, is still service management. Whatever um, technological means we get, the, the problem with a lot of people and not a lot of organizations in IT is that we totally focus on the technology. We forget the goal of what we are delivering our uh, products, our services for. Our focus should be on the results, business effects of the results, and, uh, and instead, the focus often is on the technology itself, which means that you will never earn yourself that seat on the table. Okay, thank you very much, Dirk, and then Stefan. So, uh, to my point of view, artificial intelligence will impact service management. That's what uh, what uh, Jan said. But I, uh, I would uh, like to to point out that I think it's just one more technology, just one more technology. And as Jan said, you have to to get closer to your customer. And maybe one 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 additional point, maybe um, you could use artifi artificial in intelligence for your own service management. So improve your services, improve your uh, kind of working by using artificial artificial int intelligence. But for that, it's John, uh, just one more um, technology should be integrated into service management. Okay, thank you very much, Stefan. For me, um, the artificial intelligence is uh, just another aspect of automation, and we've seen this in the past with tool providers <clears throat> promising the blue out of the sky um, on, on this is this is how you do incident, this is how you do problem and all those things. And AI is just um, a decision helping tool here. The point is, and I'll come back to Jan and Dirk here, 
is uh, when you really want to make a difference or sit on the table, it's the interaction between people and we're missing out on that when we focusing too much on, on artificial intelligence because it's not making decisions. It's just helping us to find maybe even technical solutions, but it is to sit there, to understand that, to actually have been close to a customer means to talk to that customer. Um, <clears throat> that's a relevant point. And AI has, um, it's not predominant. It will, it will play a role, it will have an impact, Dirk's absolutely right, but it, it can't be the, the silver bullet. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And I, and I think what we're witnessing right now in, in a lot of these early manifestations of uh, computers and algorithms and databases trying to help add value into customers is really, they are really the baby steps, all right? It's not AI at all. The vast majority of it that we're seeing and interacting with is pure machine learning. And um, how frustrating can that be? Well, just try and renew as a customer, as a consumer, just try and renew your broadband. Something like that. Try and do something simple like that and see the where the edges are of machine learning right at this moment and compare it to, to the kind of quality of interaction that you get with another human being. So AI will come. It's coming, all right? And uh, when it does, it's going to make an enormous difference. But right now, I think today, we're seeing the kind of very baby steps around machine learning rather than uh, true AI. Okay, so um, very good panel. Thank you very much. Very interesting start to our week. Um, we've talked about a whole variety of different skills and knowledges and experiences that um, future service managers are going to need to acquire. So let's take some closing remarks. Um, Jan, if I may, I'm going to come to you first and then Mark. Yeah, it was uh, very nice being here. Nice questions, great answers, good discussion. I think uh, the focus on customer value, I think that is something that's driving us all and uh, not just focusing at the technology that's uh, enabling that. But we must focus on the end point and the, the, the dot on the horizon. So it's nice to be here. Um, as a giveaway, uh, I'd like to invite everyone listening here to uh, join up with my new newsletter on debunking the term service. I think uh, Tuchita will provide the link to that. I'm going to Post the second uh, item on that in half an hour, so you're going to be up to speed to uh, joining us, demystifying the term process, which is causing the same pain in the well-known spot as the term service manager. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Jan, and that's a great offer. Thank you for that. Uh, Mart and then Gary. It uh, was a great pleasure to be here. Uh, it's so uh, exciting to see that after 30, 40 years of service management, how relevant it still is and uh, becoming even more relevant. Plus, uh, emphasizing on uh, what has been mentioned a couple of times, the FITSM uh, framework, um, to do a small pitch for that, I really encourage anyone uh, to check it out and uh, start benefiting from it. So uh, it, it'll keep you relevant also. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Gary and then Stefan. Yeah, thanks for the invite. I think, yeah, what we're seeing is the emergence of commercial value. So as a service manager, you know, the focus isn't just on being the elastoplast of service, but, you know, be, being customer centric and, and adding commercial value as well. So that would be my takeaway for today. So thanks for the invite. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Gary. Stefan and then Dirk. Yeah, thanks for, for, for having been here um, on episode number 50. I really enjoyed that. Hope I will be invited as a panelist in the future. Maybe number 100, we don't know, <clears throat> episode 100. Um, and lots of takeaways I had today. Um, and I think, as, as Mark says, it is still relevant after all these 30 years, although it has dramatically changed. But the term survives. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Dirk and then Suchitra. So Nick, as you said, it was a good start in the week. Uh, I have to move on to to make some money to to, to work for my customers. So um, I think um, um, what what my point of view is uh, sharing knowledge is to give knowledge and to earn knowledge. And I think that was a, a great uh, part for me. This, this hour was a was a great invest. So thank you. Hey, thank you very much indeed, uh, Sachitra. What are your thoughts on today's episode? It's been a great episode, Nick. Very befitting topic for our 
50th milestone episode and we've got great comments from our live audience as well and i love listening to the panelists so thank you to everyone Okay. All right. Very good. Well, thank you very much indeed, panel. Um, some great questions, uh, as ever, from our producers online, and also some great answers from all of the panellists as well. So thank you very much indeed for everybody's contribution. Now, we were talking a bit earlier about celebrating 50 episodes, and with that in mind, we do have some free um, freebies, really, to be able to give away some books and some examination vouchers and so on. Now, the way for you to be able to access all of that is to register for a newsletter. It's a service management related newsletter right, from APMG. And we're going to post the link to that newsletter actually in the chat for you. And that's the way in which you become eligible to go into the prize draw. And um, we'll be doing that prize draw actually on episode 52. So uh, next Monday at the same time, both on LinkedIn and on YouTube, we'll be uh, shuffling and randomly selecting people who have registered um, on that newsletter website to be able to uh, receive some of these examination vouchers. And we had several people on the panel, actually, who APMG worked for in terms of qualifications and so on. So we're going to talk to each of them about making a contribution and, um, and joining in uh, that way so that we can get as many people as possible accessing the kinds of future skills, you know, that you're going to need um, to build your careers. Okay. Now then, um, if you want to do some work in the meantime, and I'm sure that you do, there's some great opportunities now for you to search for and to view the answers to over 700 questions, which are listed on the APMG International website. These represent all of the conversations that we've had um, uh, across the 50 episodes of Level Up and even beyond that into our Midday Mentors program and also any of our product specific um, shows that we've done where they are segmented into individual chapters and individual Q&A. All right. So it's a fantastic resource. Um, you can connect with more than 80 um, experts from around the world. And of course, you can also download and listen to the audio versions of the shows on your preferred podcast platform. Now, it's a pretty powerful tool. You can either watch whole episodes and search for whole episodes, kind of as you can see um, on the screen there. There's a huge variety for you to be able to choose from, both for panel events and also one-to-one -one deep dive discussions around the Day in the Life series or the Midday Mentor series itself. If you want to look up a particular topic, uh, for example, um, Agile, then just hop, hop over to the episode search function and type in whatever uh, phrase that you want into that search string, click on the little search icon and it will pull through all of the episodes that represent the answers to those questions. And there are very many of them. So you can see we've got 86 questions there, all about um, agility, whether it be specific qualifications and certifications, or whether it be more philosophical, like the meaning of the agile mindset, as an example. All right. So very good. So just um, have a look at those resources. They're all on apmginternational.com and have a little think about how you might be able to use those to build them into your own professional development. Now, looking forward then, um, we're going to be on Friday, we're going to turn our attention to how to become an agile leader. So be sure to tune into that, 2 p.m. UK time on Friday. Subscribe to the show, and of course, we'll send you a personal summary of what's coming up next and how you can join us here on the panel and level up your career with APMG. So thanks very much, um, everybody. We'll see you next time. And yeah, we look forward to episode 100 and celebrating that in the future. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.